disclosure, you have preacher reports, so you know that sometimes I don't need the mic. If I do get um, explicitly loud, just somebody like signal me. Yes. All right, let me let, see what's happening. Well, good evening. It's, it's a pleasure to be back here with you guys. I truly, truly appreciate every opportunity that you guys have given me to come speak to you. You guys haven't told me to, not to come back because I talk so loud. <laughs> I really appreciate it because I really can't help it sometimes. But as I said, I'm thankful for Kenny for um, extending the opportunity. I'm sure there are things that he can say that probably be better, more eloquently said from him. But I appreciate every opportunity that I've been given. This evening, what we're going to talk about is correction. And the idea of scriptural correction, not only from God, but also from the, among the responsibility of our brothers and sisters. And we see throughout the entire Bible, there's this, well, from the people of Israel to modern, not modern day Christians, but Christians today, we see this idea of correction being enforced, not only from God, from his people. And we see that we all have a responsibility not only to correct ourselves, but as brothers to correct each other. We live in a world today where the idea of correcting your child is it's not only non-existent now, but it's going out of the door. To where children are being told that if your parents put your hands on you, you call the police, you run away, you, 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 you do something that simply isn't the way that it's supposed to be. We see this idea of children, they're just being told to do whatever they want, if you yell and scream loud enough, you can get whatever you want. And we're being raised in a society where you have this false sense of entitlement to where if I make enough noise or if I gather enough people on my side, I'm going to get whatever I want. And we see the same idea, sadly, is, is creeping into the church, where we have Christians who feel like if they make enough noise or they spread enough discord among the brethren that they can push whatever agenda they so please. And this idea is spurning from the fact that People are getting farther, away, farther and farther away from God, but more importantly, from the correction and chastening of God. Turn me over to the book of Hebrews in chapter 12. This idea of God chastening and correcting his people is not something that's new. It's not something that God is going to say, well, these Christians, they really need to work, so I'm going to put it on them. It's not something that God just made up all of a sudden because he just, he just wants to punish us. But we see even from Old Testament times that the curses, the, the struggles, the trials that the people of Israel went through, they weren't for no reason. They weren't so God could just say, look at all the power I have, marvel. But it was for a reason. And if you truly study all the curses, all the things that the people of Israel went through, it wasn't just so God could punish them for punishment's sake, but all the things that they went through, all the terrible things, all the time they were taken into captivity, all the times that they, they, they faced all these, all these sufferings, it was for one reason and one reason alone. It's so they, they could see the need for repentance. And the same idea comes over to the New Testament today. But as Christians, it's so often times that we forget that before we became Christians, the life wasn't perfect. That we still, as I said, we still had to pay the bills, we still had to pay the rent, gas still needed to be put in the car. But now all of a sudden when we become a Christian, we feel like God hates us. We, we're ready to cry, woe is me, woe is me. Oh God, where, where are you? And it, it's, it's, it's so sad, it truly is, that we forget all the, all the terrible things that we face before we put on Christ. And now that we have somebody where we can lay all our burdens at his feet, now that we have the creator of life who we can, who we can pray to, who we can talk to, who, we, who intercedes on our behalf, his son, that's when we, we find that we, somebody, we, we have somebody to blame. It's truly a sad thing when we truly look at it. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to start reading in verse 5. It says, and you have forgotten the exaltation which speaketh to you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faints when you are rebuked of him. This doesn't say the Lord maybe will chase you. It doesn't say you might escape it. But it says that when it comes, which it will, despise it not. Because the Lord isn't doing it for no reason. The Lord isn't doing it just to, just to say that, look, look at you. You're small, you're tiny, you're insignificant, so I'm going to take advantage of you. It's not for that reason. Otherwise, otherwise Jesus would have said, you don't, you don't need to worry about that. Once you become a Christian, I'm going to snap my fingers and all your problems will vanish away. But that's not the way the Christian life is supposed to be. That's not the way life is. And this all ties into that age-old question, why do good people suffer? You know, why is it that Christians go through these terrible times? 
When people ask me that, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how many times it's just me. With all my years of, of wisdom and experience, people ask me this question. And the first thing I, I address when people ask me why do good people suffer, is the word good in that sentence. Because even from the mouth of Jesus, we've heard that none is good except for the Father. So that's the first problem right there, assuming that we are good. But we look at it from a standpoint of why, why there is even suffering in the first place. We look at it from the time when God created man and from just up until now. If life was perfect, if we, if we did, if we had everything we needed, everything we could ever want, then there would be no need for us to worship God. We wouldn't see the point. I have everything I need, I have everything I could ever ask for, and that's, that just ties into the, the mentality of self-sufficiency, of self-dependency. If I can do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And that's not to say that you don't put you, you don't try your best in whatever you're doing. But if I had everything that I could ever want, why would there be any need for God? And it's so we truly have to realize that I can never have it all while I'm here. And neither should I want it all while I'm here. Because these things, as the word of God tells us, they're here for a short time. They're about to pass. So why would I want these things if they're temporary? Why would I want these things if they're only going to be here for a short time? The word of God says the only thing that will last is his word. So why am I not satisfied? Why am I not content with his word? Continuing in verse 6, it says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. I'm going to read that one more time. Just a bit slowly. It says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And it says, And he scrapes every son whom he received. If you want to call yourself a child of God, newsflash, it's not going to be easy. Anyone who tells you it's going to be walking on rainbows and sunshine, tell them open the Bible. Tell them read the word of God. Because time and time again it says that we will face trials and tribulations and sorrows and pain and just all these things it says we will face as a child of God. So why people think they can come into the Christian life with all these misconceptions of, of the skipping and, and happiness and jump roping, it's not going to be like that. And nor should we want it to be. <coughs> Otherwise there would be, no be no reason to have faith because there would be no, no opportunity to show our faith. There would be no reason to trust in God because we already have everything we can ever want, everything we ever need. All those things would be already there. So there would be no need for a God to provide them. Verse 7 says, if you endure chastening, God deal with you as, with you are, as if you were sons. For what son is who the father chastens not? I'm reading from the King James Version, so it's a, bit, uh, it's a bit weird. But it's basically saying, what good father doesn't chasten his son? The, throughout the entire book of Proverbs, this idea of being chastened, is that, that's basically the theme of, of, of the entire book of Proverbs, is just chasing. God chastening us, a mother chastening her, her son, a father chastening his son, and there's this idea of the rod. That just gave me some terrible flashbacks. But this idea of the rod, and the, the Bible tells us, if you, if, you don't spare the, if you spare the rod from your child, then he's in danger of hell, he's in danger of Sheol. And the same, the same goes with us today. We sometimes forget that while God is the all-powerful creator, God is the father to us. And we think of a modern-day father, of how he chases his son, he, he, wants him to, he wants the best for his son. He wants him to, to grow up in the way that he should, to be a good role model, to be a good person. And so the father wants us to be a good Christian. The, image, the best image I've, I've heard um, somebody gave me this is, imagine a sculpture, he has this big block of, he has this big block of ice. He has this big block of ice. And before he's finished, it's just, you never know what, what could possibly come from that block of ice. It's just a big, big uh, rectangle. <coughs> but when the sculptor gets to work, all you see is him chipping away, chipping away corners and pieces. But you still don't see the finished product yet. But I'm sure if that piece, the block of ice could talk, that block would be like, no, stop. Don't do this. It hurts. It's painful. The block of ice doesn't know what the finished product will look like. But the journey between that simple block of ice and the finished product, there's a lot of pain and suffering to be involved in there. There's a lot of endurance that has to be done. With every, every, piece of, uh, every piece of ice that has to be chipped away, every imperfection, every piece of sin that needs to be chipped away from us, it's not going to feel good. But there's a reason for it. There's a purpose. And it's that, it's that so God can make that perfect creature to come out on the other side. This idea that when God is done with me, I'm, I'm, there's going to be no change is simply not true. 
If I truly allow to, if I truly allow God to be the potter to the clay that I'm supposed to be, when God is done with me, who? That's a creature that I want to see. That's the kind of creature that God wants. So why don't we just allow God to do what He needs to do? In verse eight it says, "But if you be without ch chastisement, wherefore are all partakers? Then you are, you are not, you are not truly His children, but you are not sons." If we want to call ourselves sons of God, children of God, <clears throat> that isn't just a title that you, we, we wear. Like a lot, a lot of people today, we, we wear this belt, this championship belt that I call it, of being raised in the church. And we walk around with our chest puffed up, and look at me. I was raised in the church. I'm a child of God. Well, there's a lot of pain and suffering that comes along with that. Every time when somebody asks me that, it, it, it makes me nervous for, that, for those words to come out of my mouth. People ask me, you know who do. Are your parents Christian? I have to whisper, yes, I was raised in the church. Too many times you say that too proudly without truly realizing what comes along with that. It's a full package. You want to wear that title, then you've got to take everything that comes along with it. You want to wear a child of God, you want him to take the pain, the sorrow, the suffering that comes along with it. It's not going to be easy. <coughs> Just furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh who have corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Now, this isn't the way it is today. Society tries to make it like it look like it's a sin to, to, to chastise and to discipline our children. Well, not our children. The children. And I've had many conversations with my friends who, thankfully, their parents have disciplined them as well so they can relate to me. But I, I, can, I tell them, and I mean this 100%, I can look back at various times when my parents have disciplined me and I know if they didn't, I would be an entirely different person. I, look at, I can look at those times where I probably could have sat down for a week. And I know that if, that if, if my mother, my, my father, my mom didn't discipline me, I would have been on an entirely different path. I probably would not be up here standing before you. But that's because my mom did what she was supposed to do in the eyes of God. And even more so, God will do what is right in his eyes. Because God knows what's best for us. It's a foolish thing to think sometimes that we've got it figured out. We've got it in the bag. We know, we know. <clears throat> but in those moments when we think we know, the simple question is we have to ask ourselves, where did all knowledge come from? And that, was, that should stop us dead in our tracks. When we think we have all this knowledge and this wisdom and all this experience and we know, we've got it figured out. Yeah, I got this. I got this Christianity thing down. We have to stop and say, well, where, where did Christianity come from? Where did knowledge come from? Where, where did all these things come from? Continuing verse 9, it says, shall we, shall we not rather be in subjection unto the Father's spirits and live? And live, it says, and live without chastening, without, without discipline from our Father. There is no life. There is no hope. Because the Father keeps us on the straight and narrow. In the book of 1 Timothy, it says, the word of God is given for correction, for reproof, reproof. Those things are nice things. They do not feel good. As we'll even see, continue in, in, in the next verse of Hebrews chapter 12, it says, for, for, very, for they barely for a few days chasing us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, then we might be partakers of his holiness. I'm going to come back to this. Read to me in verse 11. It says, for now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. But it's, it, it's grievous. It doesn't feel good, and it's not supposed to. It's not supposed to be a joyful thing. <clears throat> when you realize the reason, when you realize what it's for, you say, oh, okay, God is trying to keep you on the right path. All right, let me straighten up. There's something that needs to be fixed. Hold on, let me take notice. Let me pay attention. Let me wake up and see what's going on. It continues to say, Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You know there's a saying? God is doing it for a reason. God is doing it for a reason. What more reason do I need to let it happen? To let God do what he needs to do? What more reason do I need than God says it's for good reason? Beloved, God is the one who put me here. Let me allow him to do what he needs to do with me. 
Going back to verse 10, it says, For they verily for a few days chasing us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers in this holiness. Now with, with this verse in mind, we have a lot of people who say, you know, God doesn't love us. God is just this emotionless robot who sits on his throne waiting to damn us to hell. You know, he's like, oh, cave on sin. Good, I got him now. But with this verse alone, we see that that's the exact opposite. That the reason that we're being chastened, the reason we're being disciplined, is so we, unworthy creatures, can partake in his holiness. It's so that we can be with him. But then as human beings, we think, you know, we've got it. We've got it figured out. We know better than God. That God obviously called me and said, Kayvon, where do you think I should put the sun? You think, you think it's all right here? How do you think I should position the earth? God obviously asked for my opinion. He asked for my input when he was making the earth. So I therefore have input in my salvation. I'm the one who created the plan. I'm created everything so I know what's best. But you know it's simply not so. Because if you read the first chapter of Genesis, my, my favorite six words are, and God said. And my other favorite three words are, and it was so. It didn't say, and God said, with Kayvon's input. It didn't say, God consulted Kayvon and then said. It says, and God said. He doesn't need our help, but we need him. Amen. And when we realize that we simply allow him to do what he needs to do with our lives, with the lives that he gave us, with the blessing that he bestowed upon us, I don't think we often think about that song, Count, Count Your Blessings, enough times. To truly realize how blessed and privileged as Christians we truly are. We think we talk about privilege, but the most privileged people on this planet are Christians. The ones who have the opportunity to be in heaven and inherit eternal life. What greater privilege could I ask for? That after I'm done suffering and going through the terrible life on this earth that I would be going through, with or without God, because this is, this is a terrible life. But with God, I know that there's something better. What more privilege could I ask for? Well, what we have to realize is that these things are going to come. We see through, uh, in the book of John 16, it says that tribulations are promised. Promised to us as Christians. And the thing we have to realize, as I said, is that while they are promised to us as Christians, we're not going to escape them as non-Christians. So a lot of people, they read that and they say, well, well this life is, is terrible. I don't, want, I don't want to do this, so I'm going to live however I want. And you ask them the question, um, did you still have to wake up this morning and go to work to pay the bills? I'm, I'm sure you did. And it's, 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 it's such a sad thing that we see, we see all these terrible things that are happening in this world. We, we hear about all this, the school shootings and, and all these terrible tragedies that happen in the world. And you ask people that think they can escape God by not being Christian, you ask them, how would you being a Christian make you escape that? And then you look at, from the book, from the standpoint of the book of Philippians, you see the difference in perspective of how we as Christians, we are so blessed. Not, not yet. Not to experience heaven yet, but we see, even on this earth, how blessed we are. When Paul wrote to the Philippian church, he talked about that peace that passes all understanding. And people, people truly sometimes, they, they don't understand what that really means. <clears throat> because I, I often present the two examples of, let's say something that's so common, you know, a Christian loses his job and a non-Christian loses his job. From the standpoint of the non-Christian, you know, they're, just, they're worried, they're stressed about, you know, how they're going to put food on the table, about what's going to happen next. You know, they're, they're scrambling to find another job. You've got to go through the entire process. And it's, it's just sick with worry and pain and just, there's all these things. And then a true non-Christian, heaven forbid they lose their job. And you, you take a step back and you, you look at it from the standpoint that God promised that he will work everything together for good for those who believe on him. And you say, wait, hold on. Maybe, maybe this job was taking away my focus from God. Maybe I can do better somewhere else. And you start asking all these questions that work into the plan of God. Maybe this wasn't the best for me. Maybe it was time for me to move on and shine my, in my life for God somewhere else. You know, we start thinking of all these things because that's the way we're supposed to operate. Maybe I have a calling from God somewhere else. You know, that, that might not be the answer, but that's the kind of questions as Christians we're supposed to ask. We're not supposed to say, woe is me, woe is me, God, why are you doing this to me? You're supposed to ask God, what is next for me? Amen. God, what do you want me to do now? 
But so as Christians, I, as we're supposed to be the most joyous people on this planet, we walk around like we have the world and more on our shoulders. And we don't have a hope of eternal life. We don't have that peace that passes all understanding. The second standpoint I want to talk about is correction from the standpoint of a brother. Now, before I even go into this, I'm going to give you guys an example. And I'm sure we've all faced it. But it's this idea when we see a, we see a brother or sister doing something they shouldn't, that's a, not in accordance to the will of God, and doing our Christian responsibility, hopefully, out of the standpoint of love, we go to them and we say, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know, what's going on? You know, I saw this. I'm concerned, you know, what's, you know, do, do we need to work on something? You know, we, we're genuinely concerned about their soul. And instead of them saying, well, thank you, brother, this, or thank you, sister, this, for being concerned, they bring up something that you did 25 years ago and say, whoa, 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 who are you? What about when you are, when you did this uh, 45 years ago? And then you, you're confused about what and how they remember you so well. But how they truly, they just, they just took that situation, just told me how it was not supposed to go. And this is why we see so many brothers, just brothers and sisters, afraid to talk to their brethren about when they're, they're, they're airing or from the way. They're afraid that they're going to get their head bitten off about something they did 56 years ago, something they did as the old man, something they did before they even put on Christ. And we see this is not the way it's supposed to be. Amen. Because God has given us our brothers and sisters to help us along the way. If God thought we didn't need them, we would not have them. But we see there's basically a three-step process to the whole thing. You know, it, it sums up to the three overall steps. Turn me over to the book of Galatians 6. The first step in this process when it comes to helping our brothers and sisters along the way is making sure that we are also doing what we're supposed to do. And it's basically eliminated that, that situation, even though people will find it, trust and believe. If people do not want to be corrected, they will find something that you did, something that you might not have said. They will take something out of context to make sure they can have that ammo to defend themselves against you. But it's basically making sure that your life is right and in accordance with God. In Galatians 6, in verse 1 it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So that's the first step. It's making sure, as it says, that we are spiritual. Making sure that our life is in accordance to God. And in Matthew chapter 7, a verse that we're also familiar with, is making sure that beam is out of our own eye. Now before I move on to step two, there's something I need to address here that a lot of people, they, they misconstrue and, and have a lot of misconceptions about now, when it comes to correcting your mother and sister in that relationship, the first thing that you want to do, even before you get into these three steps, is make sure there's love and true love on both sides, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13. Make sure there's love on both sides. Now, me coming to a brother, I'm going to give that brother the benefit of that because I love that brother. So I'm going to say, hey, you know, I saw this action. I heard about this. You know, what's going on? You know, just, just tell me what's happening. And out of love, which they should, they should see, okay, K. Warren is, 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 is interested about my soul and where I'm going to go. Let, let's try to get to the bottom of this. Along this way, very, very, that's, that's the perfect scenario right here. A lot of what could happen is, me, I see this brother, they've been riding the, 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 the spiritual high horse for a long time. I finally got him. I'm going to go to him. I'm going I'm to put him in their place. One, I don't have love. But it's still my responsibility, even though I'm doing it for the wrong reason, it's still my responsibility to go to that brother. So I go to that brother and I said, hey brother, I saw you was, I saw you walk out of that store with a bottle in your hand. Well, what's going on? Now, be, just because I didn't go to that brother out of love, that does not negate their responsibility to receive whatever I have said or brought to their attention out of love. It's, it's, it's basically, even though I don't, I don't say it in the way I should, does that negate the fact that you did something wrong? If I see you drinking and I say, who? I got him. Now, just because I did that in the wrong mindset, does that change the fact that you were drinking? It does not. Now, a lot of people, they get caught up into other people's end. So this person is a hypocrite, so therefore, I didn't do anything wrong. It does not work like that. 
And that's, it's while they're, both ends have responsibility to be loving, just because one isn't loving, that does not negate my responsibility to be loving back. So this person, they came at me, and we were, we, were, we were in a crowd, and they started yelling at me about how I was drinking. It's still my responsibility to be humble, to say, you know, thank you, brother, for bringing this to my attention. I have work to do. Now, on the other side, let's say I do go to this person out of love, but they're like, whoa, who are you to tell me what to do? You were drinking 56 years ago. I saw you take that glass of wine at that Christmas party, and you shouldn't, and, you know, you wonder, you know, were you there? How did you how did you know about that? But anyway, we, we see how a lot, we see how God's perfect plan for us can be misconstrued. But as I remind us, just because one side doesn't have love, it does not take away the responsibility of love from the other. So this person yelled at me and they did not approach me the right way, there's still something wrong I need to fix. This person did not take that error in the right way. I did my responsibility, not only to that person, but to God. Amen. And that's what we have to remember. While I'm doing this because I love my brother, I'm doing all of me because I love God. Because they didn't write the Bible, God did. God inspired men, it's God's word. But as, as I also mentioned, there, there's a fear among the brethren for helping brethren get to heaven. And I believe fear is one of the devil's biggest tools against us as Christians. Whether it be fear from talking to people, fear from handing out a simple track, free from being ready for the defense of the hope that is within us, being fearful to, to lead a song, to come up. And it's, I'm not talking about lack of ability, I'm talking about fear. Being afraid that somebody's gonna laugh at me, being afraid that I'm gonna lose a friend, I'm gonna get fired, you know, this, I'm not gonna, this, this, all these things, you, you fill in the blank. It all falls under fear. Fear of being made fun of by sinners. We're all equal. They, they can't save me. And it's, it's in those times when we realize where our focus truly is. Because if I'm focused about who's going who's gonna to love me, who's going to be my friend, why am I not focusing on the one who sent us son to die for me? Why am I not focusing on the one who's always going to love me? Rather than the people that I'm trying to help. The second step in this process of Helping from a brother who's standpoint is approaching that brother. And we see, we see that in Matthew chapter 18. If you'd like to take this time to turn there, in Matthew chapter 18. But we see how this is also misused and abused even among God's people. Where we see, we see something that might not even be true. You know, um, one of the examples I heard is, you know, we see somebody coming out like a gas station and they have a, a brown paper bag. And we know what that could mean. Obviously, we don't have extra vision, so we don't know what's in that brown paper bag. But we assume. And instead of going to that brother out of love and concern, we're like, hey, brother, you know, I saw this. You know, what's going on? You know, I'm concerned. And they're like, oh, well, you know, the store ran out of regular bags, so this is all they had. But no, we run to, to brother X, Y, and Z, and we're like, oh, hey, I saw brother Z coming out of the store, and he had a brown paper bag. What's going on here? And then before you know it, the whole Eastern Hemisphere knows about Brother Z coming out of the store with a brown paper bag, and the problem has not been fixed. But now it's been grown out of proportion. Sure, we have people who don't even know Brother Z. Who knew that Brother Z came out of the, the store with a brown paper bag? In Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell the whole world, put it on Facebook, make sure everyone knows about it. I'm sure that's what it says because I'm sure that's what a lot of people do. But no, the Lord says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him, go and tell him his fault. Now, in that conversation, do not bring up things that happened 56 years ago. Do not bring up things that have no concern with the one matter. But if we see something that concerns us, we go and tell that brother, that concern, because that's how, as Christians, we're supposed to solve our problems. There we hear that angel question, if we can't deal with them here, how are we going to deal with them in heaven? It says, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Go and tell him and him alone. If he shall hear thee, you have gained a brother. It's so sad. You know how many times people have 
have, have, have said, you know, given this example of how they have done something wrong in somebody else's eyes, and they find out about it 65 years later, and they're like, well, I never knew that. How come I'm now hearing about this? And it's in those situations that you will find people bring up things that they never brought to you before. And it's, I didn't realize how serious this, is, this was until that happened to me. I was talking to this one young man about something that he did, and then something that I did a couple years ago, it, it came up in the conversation and I was, I was shocked. I'm like, whoa, I didn't know I did that. And then my next question was, why are you waiting until now to tell me? If it, was a pro if it bothered you, obviously it bothers you enough to remember it 60 years ago. Why didn't you tell me then so I could do something about it? Because now I'm thinking about all the other times that I, I unknowingly did that same thing, and that could have been stopped 60 years ago. But instead, we want to we wanna hold on to that thing. We want to we hold in this ammo in our guns so we can, we can just wait until they come, so we can just let it loose. And we see that's not the way it's supposed to be. Because it's not a, it's not a survival of the fittest race. We're all trying to get our brothers and sisters in heaven with us. In verse 16 it says, but if you will not hear thee, then take, take with thee one or two more. I did not see, go ahead and put it on Facebook, go ahead and tell the entire world, go ahead and gossip, and, and it, it, it doesn't say all that. This is the mature way as Christians to handle a problem. It says, take with thee one or two more, then in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And it's not because you're trying to you're trying to gang up on the person or you're trying to make them feel small. If they have a problem with it, tell them consult the word of God. These you often have to reassure people that these are not my words, my thoughts, my opinions. These are from God, who I am trying to serve. So if you're questioning me, read the Bible. Verse 17 says, and if you neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. And if you neglect to hear the church, let him. Be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. But as we see, people skip over verse 15 and 16 and jump to the latter part of verse 17. They're like, whoa, he's a heathen. Stay away, stay away. And then your next question, did you talk to him? Did, does he even know about this? And we see the progression from 0 to 100. And we see that's the way things are dealt with in this world. I remember being in the seventh grade. I just moved from an entirely different country. And where, where I came from, if we had a problem, we ran to the nearest adult. Well, also, I came up in a country where adults, they can whip the children left and right. So it was an exciting thing when somebody crossed you to run ahead and tell them though, so you could see what was going to happen next. But just a year before, that's the way I learned to solve my problems, to, to tell an adult and allow the adult the proper authority to deal with it. And the next year, I moved here, and I witnessed this, and I was, I was so shocked. This one young man, he stepped on another young man's toe. And I was like, whoa, okay, well, you know, tell him about this. And instead of, you know, talking to him or even talking to a teacher, he went and he called his friends, and that young man got beat up. And I was, I was so shocked as to how the escalation from your toe being stepped on to where you can just say, hey, you know, buddy, you know, watch, watch out, you know, to where violence was needed for that situation. And we see that the same way as adults, when we're supposed to put away childish things, that's the same way we do with our, with our problems. Somebody crosses us, we're like, well, let me go call back up. Let me call X, Y, Z, L, M, N, O, P. Like that's going to solve the problem. And so we, we jump from zero to 100. What the people that we're supposed to love, we're supposed to care for, we're supposed to be worried about if they're doing wrong. But instead we're ready to, we, we, we make it seem like the Christian life is only one of us is going to make it, so I'm going to do it best. We treat the Christian life like there's only one crown, there's only one mansion, and I'm going to make sure I get it. So I'm going to put all of you down and I'm going to make sure I get on top. But it's not so. For Jesus himself said there are many mentions. So why am I not trying to get you there? And why are you not doing me the same courtesy? Not only for me, but for God. Amen. So that's the second step. The first step is to make sure my life is right with God. <clears throat> second step is approaching that road one-on-one. -on -one. And the third step, even as we see, as it's talked about in Titus chapter 3, if you'd like to turn there, is if all else fails, if all else fails rather, you talk to that brother, you've gotten two or three witnesses, you brought him before the church. We clearly see that that person simply does not want to follow God. Now, 
let that not be mistaken with just give up on that person, never talk to them again, and, and hope they figure it out. But we clearly see what Paul said both to Timothy and to Titus. In Titus chapter 3, in verses 10 and 11, it says, A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he is such a subverted and sinner, be condemned of himself. If he doesn't want to be saved, you cannot save him. And I think a lot of people, we, we, we think we can, we can save people. That if we try hard enough, that we can bring them to heaven with us. And that's not, now, be very careful as to how I phrase that. Because a lot of people think they can, they can, they can pray people in heaven, and they can, they can will people and hold people in heaven, but it's not going to work that way. Because the same way that God met us halfway, God set up the perfect plan of salvation that we can be saved, if he doesn't want to take it, that's between him and God. Now, as I said, that is not to be mistaken with give up on that person and hope for the best. If you see that, if you see that person, you, you, you talk to them, you say, hey, what's going on? You inquire into their life because that doesn't mean that love stops. The love doesn't stop. You don't stop caring about that person. You don't stop trying to get them back into the fold. Because God doesn't stop trying to get us back. We see the same way in Luke chapter 15. The, the father of the prodigal son, he did not carry on his business as usual. He didn't say, oh well, I have another son, I'm going to just move on. We see that he was waiting patiently to where when the son, he was but afar off. The father, he recognized him and he ran. He moved quickly and he fell on his neck with compassion and kissed him. Now why we ought to realize that's the way the father treats us, that's the way we're supposed to treat our brother. It's supposed to be a joyful thing when a brother is, when we see that brother, we're supposed to be waiting for him. We say, hey, what's going on? How are things? But there's also a difference between being loving, compassionate, and just carry on like nothing ever happened. As we know, the word of God tells us that evil companionship corrupts good morals. That's not to say just continue with that person like nothing ever happened, like there's not sin that needs to be fixed, there's not sin in the camp, that there's not a loving that good to love the whole lump. There needs to be a difference in that relationship, but that does not warrant giving up, saying, oh well, he doesn't want to try, so why should I? No, 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 no. You should try because God said so. Amen. What we see, as I said, there's supposed to be a difference in that relationship. There's a certain extent as to where we're supposed to go. But we can only go as far as they will let us. If that person slams the door and says, don't come back, well, try again next year. Try again the year after that. And what we have to realize is that sometimes that's all it takes. That one time where we, we separated from that brother and then we saw them on the street, we didn't just ignore them. We said, you know, brother, you know, I hope things are well with you. Hope to see you once again. God bless you. That might be all it took. Because they're maybe expecting you to say, well, he doesn't come to church with me anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him the cold shoulder. I'm going to ignore him. But what they see, that we still express that love, that care for their life. That genuine faith in God as to how we're supposed to live. That might be all it takes. Well, if that person still talks to me even though I made that mistake, maybe it's time for me to come back home. We never know because at the end of the day, in the process of saving somebody's soul, from the way I see it, as, as forward to the creeping line, there are three steps. The seed being planted, the seed being watered, and then finally God giving the increase. Now, too many times as, as human beings, we think that we can take care of that whole three-step process just by, by bravado. We've got it. We can do this. But no, no, no. It's outlined that all we're called to do is plant the seed or water the seed. And then God will give the increase when God gives the increase. After that, the ball is in God's court. He is going to do what he needs to do. I need to concern myself with that because God has given me the ability to plant the seed and water the seed. That is more than some of us can handle. So why am I trying to put more on my plate? God has said, okay, Bob, this is what you can handle, planting and watering. Okay, God, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to take care of. And along that way, I'm going to fall, I'm going to make mistakes, and God is going to say, come on, get back up. I'm going to whip you in a shape. Be like, okay, God, you got this. You know exactly what you're doing. You put me here. You created me. You gave me the plan. You gave me the instructions. You gave me everything. 
I'm going to do it with your help, with your chastening, with your discipline, because you love me and I love you. And sometimes, as I often say, we sometimes have to look ourselves in the mirror. We have to see ourselves saying these words so we can truly humble ourselves and realize what we're doing. We sometimes have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, you are not here for your purpose. You did not put yourself here. God knows what he's doing. Amen. We hear time and time again, God is omniscient, all powerful, he's omnipotent, he's everywhere. You know, we hear these things, but sometimes we have to, sometimes we have to sit ourselves and we have to lock ourselves in the bathroom, look ourselves in the mirror and give ourselves a stern talking to. In, that, in those moments when we think we've got it figured out and we know we don't need God and we, we, we're about to cry, what we see, we have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, God knows what he's doing. So when those times come that God does chasten us in whatever way, form or shape, that he sees fit, whatever way he sees will get us back to him. The same way he knew those curses, those punishments, those times that he put the Israelites, he allowed the Israelites to be in captivity. He knew that that would allow them to come back to him. We see that the same with the, with the, with the book of Judges. We see the same cycle of Judges over and over again. The people that would sin against God, and the Lord would deliver them into, into some kind of captivity. They would cry out to the Lord because they saw the need for repentance, and the Lord would raise up a deliverer. And so we see that even though they did it time and time again, the most important part was the fact that they saw the need for repentance. And you see, with, with, um, with the situation with Samson, that is entirely gone. We see three out of the four steps of the cycle of judges when it comes to Samson. The people they sinned against God, God delivered them into Babylonian captivity, Philistine captivity rather. And they, they were okay with it. They were fine. They're like, oh, we're good. There's no need for there's no need for change. There's no need for repenting. Even though that was God's way of chasing them. That was God's way of saying, hey, wake up! You have done something wrong. There is need for change. Something needs to be fixed here. But they were like, nah, we're good. And sometimes we approach God with the same attitude. Nah, we're good. We think we've got to figure it out. We think that we know more than God, and it doesn't matter what God does, we, 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 we're going to do it. And sometimes we put our efforts and our strengths in the wrong area. We try so hard to live a double life. We try so hard to live a hypocritical life. We try to see how far we can go without our brothers and sisters discovering our, our backup life. We try to see how far we can go before something goes wrong. And that's not the way we're supposed to do. That's not the way we're supposed to live our life. I'm supposed to try as hard as I can with God guiding me. That's where my efforts are supposed to be. To see how far I'm going to go with the strength of God, with the armor of God, with the weapons of God that can tear down the strongholds of the devil. That's where my effort and my strength is supposed to be. Not how far I can go before the light gets turned on and somebody finds out my evil deeds. Too many times we try so hard to defend sin, to defend wrongdoing, to defend all these things. We waste our time. We should be trying to win souls. We should be trying to please God. We waste our time ignoring the chastening of God. I was talking to this one, this one, this, um, this young man one evening. I was my car was being towed, and he um, he asked me what I do. And, you know, I told him I go to college. You know, I preach sometimes. And he got he got so excited. So we started talking, and something he said it occurred to me like I, I already knew it, but hearing it from somebody else's mouth like it just it opened my eyes. He said that. As God's children, God is going to do what he needs to do to get us back on the right path. As we say in the 23rd Psalm, for his name's sake. But what he said, he, he truly put it in literal terms that truly got me to, to, to think. He said God will do whatever he needs to do, whether it be in, in sickness, whether it be losing our job, losing our car, losing something. So whether it be, you know, we, we, we lose something or something is taken away. God is going to do what he needs to do for his name's sake to get us back on the right path because God loves us. And when he truly said in those literal words, I started thinking about all the times when something goes wrong, we cry. We're like, oh no, God, take this away, take this away. And as Christians, we truly need to get in the habit of thanking God for the bad times. Of thank time, thanking God for all the times things get rough. For when things look a bit shaky, when things don't look like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that's when we need to get in the habit of thanking God because that's when God is chasing us. That's when God is saying, hey, straighten up. Fix whatever needs to be fixed. That's when God is pointing out to us that something isn't right. Now, that's not to be said that sometimes there are some things that happen to us that are completely not our fault. 
that we, we didn't cause, you know, even in, when, um, in the book of John, when the, the man was blind, we see that the apostles asked, God, um, asked Jesus, you know, who sinned this, this man or his, or his parents that he was born blind? But it said that the, Jesus said that the work of God may be made manifest in him. But at the end of the day, with anything that goes wrong or right, our mindset should be, what can I, what, what can I fix? What needs to be adjusted? What is God chiseling away that I need to, to pay attention to? And so we have, to, we have to stop wasting our time with these childish things and allow God to do what he needs to do with our lives. We, we have been given this time this evening to do just that. To wake up and pay attention to God. As my mom, she, she always tells me, wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> and it's that time. God's saying, all right, you're wasting your time. Just get back on the path. Do what you need to do. Time and time again, we've heard, as it says in Romans 10, 17, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're here this evening, you've been blessed by God with another opportunity to hear his word. And we're called to believe, as it says in Mark 16 and 16. For he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, for he that believeth not. It doesn't say he that believeth not might not be saved or might be saved. There's no might, because God doesn't deal with mights and maybes. When God says it is sure, you believe it or you don't believe it, that isn't going to change it. But God has laid it out for us clear and plain. If you don't want it, that's, 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 your, that's your business. God isn't going to change it. For Christ died for one time for all men. As it says in Acts 17 and verse 34, at this time of ignorance, God will have, but now commands all men that were to repent. And I think we do focus on that word repent all, all, a lot. But one word that we often glaze over is that word commands. God commands all men everywhere to repent. It isn't a suggestion. It isn't an option. It doesn't say, well, maybe, maybe you repent. Because as I said, God doesn't operate in those things. If you want to serve me, these are the commandments. This is what I have commanded. Do it. If you want to inherit eternal life. We're called to make that confession that says in Romans 10 and 10. For the heart, men believe on the righteous birth of mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In these age old words that we heard from Peter on the day of Pentecost, as in Acts 2 and verse 38, as he said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And further down, it says, The Lord added to the church the others who being saved. And as we know, in Revelation 2 and verse 10, it says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you. Remain faithful unto death, rather, and I will give you a crown of life. And every time I hear those words, crown of life, I think of the, 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 the I think of the, um, I think of how much, how much courage, the word courage. I think of how much courage Paul had when he wrote those words to Timothy. Confidence, that's the word, thank you. Confidence. I think how much confidence Paul had when he wrote those words to Timothy saying, I have run the course, I have fought the good fight, there is now a crown of righteousness laid up for me in heaven. And I think about how much confidence it took Paul to write those words, because those words don't come from, well, maybe I did it, maybe I made it. Maybe there's a crown, Paul didn't say that, Paul said there is. That was, a, that was a statement of assurance and faith in the promises of God. And that's where we ought to live our life, knowing that if we're blessed, before we see the end of the day, we can lay our head on our pillows at night. We can go to sleep saying that if God, if I'm not allowed to wake up tomorrow, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me in heaven. Or if God blesses me with another day, I'm going to live with that confidence. Not in myself, because I can't save myself, but in the promises of God. Amen. And every time I get to this part, I think of how, um, how amazing it is the God that we serve. That even after he's given us this opportunity to become a Christian, God still is aware that we will fall, we will fall short, we will make mistakes, and we will need his discipline. We will need his chastening. And he gives us time and time again opportunity to come back onto him. If we've fallen or we've made a mistake, if we, 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 we shift, put this, put, uh, we've shifted aside the chastening of God, we have an opportunity, says, as it says in 1 John 1, 9, we're called to confess our sins. In Acts 8, 22, we're called to pray. And finally, or we're called to repent, rather, in Acts 8, 22, and they're called to pray. And we've had an opportunity this evening to do that, to come back unto the Lord, to truly realize, even this evening, I'm sure there are many of us who can look back onto those times when we were either chastened by our parents, by our friends, by our brothers, or by God. In those times where we knew something entirely different could have become of our lives, where we could have been somewhere else, but somebody, somewhere, God allowed that person to preach the gospel to us, to say, hey, wake up. This isn't the way you're supposed to be living. And here, once again, God has given us an opportunity to wake up, to come back unto him, to make it right. 
If you're in any way subject to the invitation, why don't you come forward now as we stand and sing the invitation song? Come on, boys.